I know you've had a lot of affinity for agricultural real estate in the recent past. Do you still hold that? And what are your thoughts about agricultural real estate investing today? I'm very optimistic about agriculture. Agriculture has been a disaster for 30 or 40 years. The average age of farmers in America is 58. Japan is 66. Keith, no but more people in America study public relations and study agriculture. Agriculture is a nightmare. That is changing now, in my view, for various reasons, partly because we're running out of farmers all over the world, not just in, in the United States. And that's going to lead to better times. Either we're not going to have clothes anymore and we're not going to eat food anymore, or agriculture is going to get better. Long term, it's great to invest in mandatory needs. People need to live somewhere with housing. People need to eat food with agriculture. What's a good way to play agriculture? If you want to invest in something agriculture, what's your favorite way in order to be a profiteer from that as far as an investment vehicle, Jim? I said before, Keith, maybe you should buy property in the Midwest or in the agricultural area. If you're in Canada, you know the agricultural areas everywhere in the world because farmers are going to be better off and so prices in those areas are going to go higher, whether it's for houses or farmland or whatever. That's what you should be looking at. That's one way to play. By definition, inflation means higher prices for cotton, for corn, for copper, for gasoline, for everything like that. So you can participate by buying commodities. Commodities scare a lot of people, but there's no reason to be scared. They're now they're ETFs that you can buy commodities very easily. If you own agricultural ETFs and the prices of wheat and corn and cotton go higher, you're going to say, wow, this is fun. I'm making a lot of money from inflation. I'm making money from inflation. From a fundamental supply demand standpoint, agriculture can make a lot of sense. A rapidly increasing population, at least worldwide, still for the next 75 or 80 years, while at the same time, the amount of arable land is going down. So you talk about demand up and supply down. They're just some of those basic fundamentals within agriculture. And then you have to get in where you fit in with your preferred crop type or, or nation you're going to invest in and so on. You have learned your lessons well. You know, you and I talked about inflation earlier in the chat here. One way people people like to hedge against inflation is increasingly with a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin, where there is a finite supply of 21 million Bitcoins. What are your thoughts? And is cryptocurrency like Bitcoin a legitimate way to hedge oneself against inflation? Well, first of all, all money is going to be on the computer, Keith. There's no question. Of, it already is in China. You can't take a taxi in China with money. You have to have your money on your computer. It just doesn't work otherwise. We've had hundreds of cryptocurrencies already disappear and go to zero more will go to zero too. You can't, we have thousands of them now. Maybe they're all going to work. It usually doesn't work. The world usually doesn't work that way. So money is going to be on the computer, but in my view, it's going to be government money. When the U.S. money is on the phone, on the computer, I don't think the U.S. is going to say, okay, this is money now. But if you want to use their money, you can use their money. That's not the way governments think or you, a, a politician, bureaucrats don't like to lose control. They like to keep their monopoly. And I suspect that that will happen again. So if these currencies, any other, become viable as currency, I suspect the governments will step in. They always have. We'll see. But Keith, Keith, I want to say, if you're good at trading, and these are nothing wrong with these as trading vehicles right now, and if you're good at trading, do it. But if you think you're going to have the new U.S. dollar, I suspect you're not. There will be a new U.S. dollar on the computer, but it's going to be theirs. I would love for there to be alternatives, but that's not the way governments think. You bring up a good point that's actually lost on a lot of people. I'm talking about Bitcoin, which is, I'll call it the most successful and well-known cryptocurrency. Yeah, but how many thousands of cryptocurrencies are out there that died, that went to zero, that don't even exist anymore, and that people lost money on? No one's talking about that because they don't exist anymore. That's exactly right. And many, even Bitcoins have been stolen from, from people's wallets, et cetera, et cetera. It may well happen, Keith. I'm skeptical. I would prefer to have what governments approve of as money right now. Because if they make it illegal, I certainly am not going to use the alternative currencies. I'd rather be poor and out of jail than rich and in jail. <laughs> Some wonder if cryptocurrency can really be shut down. Maybe this is somewhat analogous to an executive order 6102 from about 
90 years ago when physical possession of gold and silver was made illegal by the United States government and confiscated. I mean, you could still own it, but it just wasn't legal to own it. I mean, can cryptocurrency be shut down? Is, is that realistic? Well, the crypto people say it's not realistic, that they can outsmart the government. They also said it was anonymous, but as you know, in the last two or three days that they have found that there was a big heist recently where they closed the pipeline. They demanded money from a pipeline. They yeah. got it. They were paid in cryptos. Well, the government tracked them down and has gotten it back now. So the idea that these are, that everything is anonymous and can be shielded from the government is being proven wrong more and more every day. So it can happen that the government can do a lot of things. I mean, I don't particularly like this at all. Not at all, Keith, but governments do have that power. Can they shut it down? If they make it illegal, most people, and me and others, will not use it anymore. Recently in Myanmar, for instance, they just close the internet. Without the internet, you don't have cryptocurrency. But without electricity, you don't have cryptocurrency. You can go down to the shop and say, look, my money is on my computer, but my computer is inaccessible. This guy's going to say, I know you need bread, and I would love to give you some bread and wheat, I mean, and, and everything, and some beans. You've got to give me money. I'm sorry your computer's down. I'm sorry electricity's down, et cetera. So the government can do all sorts of things, whether we like it or not. And I don't like it, but facts are facts. Jim, you've had a lot of wisdom. You've published so many impactful books over the years. You've traveled to so many nations. So, you know, I'd really like to know, what do you think that a young person should know today? Whether that has to do with investing or personal development or, or anything else, maybe something that that young person's not thinking about. What should they be thinking about or investing their time in? Everybody should invest their time now, especially in knowing about the world, preferably a second language. I grew up in the United States where nobody cared if you didn't didn't speak English. But in the next 50 years, next 100 years, it's going to be important to know a second language well, and it's going to be very important to know about the world. You know, most people when I was a kid didn't know where China was, didn't care, didn't need to know. But that's 80 years ago, that's 100 years ago. That world is gone. So I would suspect everybody, I would urge everybody to learn about the world as much as you can. You know, I recently ran into a woman from China who didn't know that Beijing was the capital of China. So there's a lot of ignorance out there. And if you don't know about the world in the next 50 years, you're not going to have an advantage. You're certainly going to be at a disadvantage. So I would learn as much as you can about the world outside of your own country. I would learn about possibly re residing, living outside your own country. And I would certainly try to learn another language if you can. You're preaching to the choir. One of my degrees is in geography, so I often think spatially. And yeah, you're right, Jim, especially here in the United States. I'm sure it's only a minority of people that could adequately point to Brazil on a map or Spain or Myanmar or South Africa or any of those sorts of places. And it's increasingly relevant in an increasingly globalized world. Most Americans cannot find the Pacific Ocean. On the map. <laughs> they say, who cares where the Pacific Ocean is? Well, they're going to learn. They're going to learn. My advice to everybody is to watch Get Rich, listen to Get Rich, because difficult times are coming. You need to get knowledge, and once you get knowledge, you'll get worried. And once you get worried, you'll do something. You'll start being prepared. And the people who are ready will come through difficult times in sparkling colors. Many people got rich in the Depression in the 30s. Most didn't. Most lost a lot. But if you know what you're doing and you're prepared, you will come through the next very bad times with flying colors and you'll be rich. So get ready, do your homework.